Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to the organizers of this conference. I'm very excited. Uh, my name is Claire Sharifi. I'm a reference and instruction um, librarian at the University of San Francisco. And today I'm going to be speaking to you about how I adapted long complex library instruction programs for the online environment in response to COVID-19. But first I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from my home in Alameda, California, which is within the territory of Huchin, the an ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people. This is a picture, so and a note about USF. So USF is a mid-sized Jesuit university in San Francisco. We're frequently confused with UCSF, the large graduate medical and health sciences school, which is just a couple miles away. This is a picture of campus uh, clearly taken prior to the COVID shelter in place in March of 2020, because there are actually people there. The campus has been closed since then, and we've been 100% online. Uh, USF has a large school of nursing and health professions. And in nursing specifically, we have, you know, from bachelor's to doctoral, so we have a BSN, a number of MSN programs and a DNP program. <clears throat> so, I'm going to talk about two one shot instruction sessions, one in our BSN program and one in our DNP program. And these are just two of many instruction sessions I do every semester. But when we transitioned fully online, these were two that I was particularly worried about. There's the two sessions are long and intensive and have really been the primary place. Um, where I've delivered research and information literacy instruction for the D BSN and DNP programs. So they are, um, they're big kind of important um, instruction sessions. Um, so I'm going to give you a little background about each of these classes. The BSN evidence-based inquiry course is the main kind of EBP research methods course for undergrad nursing students. Uh, the deliverable for the course is a big group project that consists of a series of five scaffolded papers on all on the same nursing research topic for each, you know, within each group. It's the most research intensive assignment the students have in their BSN program. And the in-person instruction for this course, for this session, was characterized by a combination of lecture and instruction and a lot of small group work. <clears throat> students were determining their topics and searching databases. Um, and usually the session took between two and a half and three hours. And when it was finished, almost all the groups left with all of the articles they needed for their assignments. So it was intensive um, and long, but it was also really positive and, and productive. They, students left with, you know, left feeling good um, and, you know, having kind of a weight off their shoulders because they'd found all of their research. And then moving on to the DNP, um, instruction session. So the class that the session was for, evidence-based scholarship, is intended to support the beginning phases of research for students' final DNP project, basically the equivalent of their dissertation. Um, however, at, at the point in the program when this class is offered, not all students have made a final decision about their EBP project. Um, some are still working on developing a topic, while some are totally locked in. So that um, that always makes the instruction session interesting and challenging um, to provide. And when I delivered the session in person, um, there was a lot, probably too much lecture and database demonstration because the, the discrete assignment they're working on requires that they execute a search in a number of different databases. So it was it was really a lot kind of overwhelming information. Um, and both the BSN and so both of these sessions were really long and busy and I really wanted to be thoughtful about how I translated these sessions to zoom. So what I did for both com both courses was some combination of the following. So I flipped almost all of the lecture and database demonstration and delivered it via canvas module so in Canvas is our learning management system. I provided um, some synchronous instruction in partnership with faculty and then follow up and ongoing support. So, and I really wanted to make sure that I was designing instruction that was really optimized for online, the online environment, but it also had to be manageable and realistic in terms of workload. 
and provide students with the support they needed during what was really a challenging time, is a challenging time. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking about the Canvas modules. So um, I used kind of some existing content. Um, and the first thing I did was, um, you know, incorporate content that I've created before, um, that I'd used before for Canvas modules, but now it was a little bit more important because they needed to be, this needed to be the primary place where students received instruction um, uh, on database searching and um, whatnot. So the modules had three components. It had, uh, they had an Adobe Spark presentation for the database instruction. So I used text within the Adobe Spark presentation to explain concepts related to keyword searching and then embedded instructional screencasts at the end of it so students could see concepts applied in the database. And um, at the end of the session, I'll pop a link into the Spark presentation for folks um, into the chat. I also added LibGuide content to Canvas. So I started out by embedding content directly from LibGuides into the Canvas page, which was so easy, on, you know, easy for me. But I was really concerned about accessibility issues within Canvas. So I transitioned to just using LibGuide content as inspiration and creating new Canvas content. And of course, I wanted this content integrated into the course. LMS into the Canvas course because it formalized and incentivized it for the students. And finally, I wanted to include some low stakes assessment in the Canvas module. And for these two courses specifically, I used Canvas quizzes. But in the past, I've embedded Qualtrics surveys directly into um, Canvas. And that's a really handy workaround when you want a low stakes assessment to keep students engaged and to do knowledge checks but you might not want that assessment going into the grade book. This is really helpful, particularly when you're putting something into Canvas Commons um, and it might you know, totally throw off a faculty member's grade book if you had um, a quiz with grading in there. So um, the Qualtrics surveys were a nice workaround. Um, so this is how I delivered the asynchronous lecture portion. And then the synchronous sessions, they looked a little bit different for the DNP students and the BSN. So with the DNP, the faculty member and I set aside two hours of class time. We created an online sign up sheet and had students sign up for 15 minute individual appointments within that two hour time frame. What worked really well was giving the students and their research topics this focused attention. Our timing, however, did not work well at all. 15 minutes wasn't enough and we didn't build in any cushion time. And we were pre pretty quickly running 10 to 15 minutes behind, which made the whole Zoom, people were coming in halfway during Zoom sessions, it was very awkward. Um, the other issue is the instruction session took place a little bit too late in the semester. The first draft of their assignment had already been submitted and they were required to meet with me and the professor. So those two things changed the dynamic. Um, my suggestion for um, improvements to their research plan were taken less as support or help and more as a critique or judgment on the work they had already completed. So being aware of that dynamic is really something um, that I think will inform how I go about this, this coming semester, this current semester and in the future. And finally, cohorts and classes have their own personalities. Most of these students, for various reasons, were taking this class out of sequence or retaking it or taking it earlier or later than other students. So there, there wasn't a lot of group cohesion within the class and they were very quiet. So that, that can make um, instruction sessions a little challenging. So moving on to the BSN synchronous session. Um, the faculty member and I have been working together for a long time. So we have it kind of down to a science time and timing was fine. We had that all figured out. The synchronous session for this class was three hours long. The faculty member and I put everyone into Zoom breakout rooms and we just visited each breakout room, um, answer questions, talk about search strategies. Many had already completed research because they'd watched those Canvas modules and we were available to really dive into critical appraisal and evaluating the articles they'd found. Um, and when the students weren't meeting with us, they were working within their groups on their papers. There was some Zoom awkwardness when you know, you're know you in a physical classroom together 
it's easy to see who needs help. It's easy to check in with the professor. Um, so the professor and I ended up doing a lot of texting. Um, we just communicated via text message. And that's something I definitely recommend when working with instructors, other instructors in breakout rooms. Don't just rely on Zoom, have another way of kind of checking in and communicating. Overall, this was a really an effective synchronous session, but it was a lot, it was a lot of students. It was three, three hour sessions. So it was pretty, pretty tiring. So moving on to follow up for the DNP. After the individual appointments with DNP students, we did a debrief and a Q&A during their scheduled class session. The professor and I had taken notes during our consultations and collaboratively, we created a list of things that were important to cover with the group as a whole to make sure everyone heard. Um, and then this was followed by a handful of one-on-one -on -one consultations with students who are still kind of grappling with their research strategies. The BSN follow-up was really multifaceted. Over the five weeks or so after the synchronous session, I held weekly drop-in office hours just for this class that were really popular. Students showed up every week. Um, I advertised my regular shifts starting, excuse me, staffing our chat with the librarian queue, so um, our instant message service. Much, And this is much like I used to um, encourage students to come and find me at the reference desk during my reference desk shift. So I said, you know, you can use our instant message um, service anytime, but if you want to talk to me, these are the hours that I um, that I'll be there. Um, and students were also welcome to book individual appointments with me. Um, the professor also held extended office hours for this class, so we were able to refer students back and forth to each other based on what the students needed. And I want to note that probably 90% of these follow-up interactions were about APA or writing. In my library, like probably many others, there's a lot of robust conversations around whether or not APA support is like our job, if it's our responsibility, or is it the writing center, or is it the faculty? Um, I've always been very willing to take on APA questions, but during COVID, I totally embraced it. It seemed like such a simple, easy way I could make my work more student-centric during this like super challenging time. So results and feedback. So starting with the DNP, um, we did a post-class survey that I just popped into Canvas as an announcement. And overall, it was positive. Students reported that they liked the individual cons consultations uh, more than they liked the longer lecture. Uh, they liked meeting with the librarian and professor at the same time. And they thought the appointment sessions were either just the right amount of time or too short. Um, so overall, I would characterize the responses as positive, but not enthusiastic. There were very few comments in the open text fields. Um, and based on our experience and the feedback, the primary change we're making is we're moving the date of the session up so um, it's way earlier in the semester, two weeks in advance of when their first draft is due. And we're creating a lot more flexibility with appointment time and length. And I'm hoping this improves the experience for the students. Uh, and now for results and feedback for BSN, the changes the professor and I made to the delivery of in the instruction session and kind of our ongoing commitment to being available to these students made it a much more student-centric experience. And this research um, assignment is something that causes a lot of stress and anxiety among nursing students, our nursing students. So um, that was really helpful and resulted in really good rapport with the students. It was definitely a lot of work. I found that two things made it more sustainable, having those dedicated office hours carved out in advance and telling students to contact me during my instant message shifts. And overall, the feedback was really positive from students. So here's a quick little quote uh, from one of the students. This was a tough project, but I feel grateful to have gone through the experience of writing all these different papers. And I feel like it will be very helpful in the future for us to understand how to do this high level academic, very structured writing and research process. And finally, um, moving instruction online did encourage or force in innovation and experimentation. And I'm really grateful for that. We're online again this semester, so I'm taking what I learned last semester and building on it. And I'm hopeful that folks watching this came away with something useful and informative. So thank you. Thank you so much.
Um, we have three minutes left for questions. So uh, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. And we'll just see if anyone has any, anything to ask. It was a really interesting presentation. I really liked your slides. Very simple. Thank you. I'll pop my email into the chat if folks have any questions after the fact, if anything comes to mind. Excellent, thank you. So Jennifer is just asking, uh, how many students in total did you work with? So there were there were 13 doctoral students in that course and um, about 150 BSN students. So I'd say between 150 and 120. And then it looks like, oh, sorry. Um, uh, no, that's okay. Uh, Christine is asking if there's anything that cu got cut off at 15 minutes, but uh, we didn't we didn't cut Claire off. So is there anything else that you wanted to add? Chris, um, nope, me? Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think she was wondering whether we had. We, whether we no, had no, I was minimum. sorry. I was asking about when her appointments were happening because they oh, were. Oh, I see. Were there things that they yeah. were just getting into that she had to cut off because of the timing? Sorry. No, we just went late. So <laughs> that's a good question, Christine. We just kept talking. So the 15 minutes, 15 minute appointments ended up being 20 or 25 minute appointments. And then it was like the doctor's office, their nurse practitioner. So. <laughs> You know, just everything ends up kind of um, being late. All right. Um, and then Kelly O'Brien Jenks is just asking, would you consider meeting with students alone, not with their content professor? Definitely. Um, so I feel like it was really helpful in the synchronous sessions to work in partnership with faculty. But for the follow up sessions, almost all of those were just myself and the student. And I think that that's really, really helpful. Um, it just gives the students some space to kind of um, talk, you know, speak, you know, honestly about the assignment and their experience. Um, and it's a little less pressure talking with a librarian as opposed to a faculty member, I think. I don't grade them. Um, so, so definitely, um, and a lot of times when I do instruction sessions, the professors aren't there, so. Um, yeah, I would definitely consider meeting with students alone. All right. Uh, we have a little cushioning time between our folks, uh, so I'll allow for this last question and then we'll cut it off. Um, Andrew is just asking, how many Canvas modules did you make for the flipped content? So it was one module with, I would say, like five or six different pages within it. Um, so there was some kind of general library searching, general kind of information literacy instruction, and then more specific database um, searching content that was delivered via the Adobe Spark. I hope that makes sense, Andrea. Feel free to email me if you want to chat about it. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, we have a little padding time in between Claire and Janice, so if um, you would like to run to the bathroom or anything like that, get yourself a snack. Uh, now is a good time to do that. And then and then we'll get started with Janice's content at 12.40. So we'll give you give folks a couple of minutes. Thank you, Claire. That was great. That's good. Well, when I'm doing a long session or something like this, where it's kind of um, a lengthy type of a Zoom or a remote instruction, I would break it up where maybe every hour I would do a mental break. So I give the students a choice. I would say, do you want a joke, a magic trick, or do you want chair exercise? And then I lead them through like a few moves. So I'm going to ask everyone now, what's your preference? Do you want a joke, chair exercise, or a magic trick? Oh, there's definite votes for magic trick in okay. chat here. <laughs> so because I'm sharing my screen, well, let me let me unshare because I feel, feel free to stop sharing. Yeah. 
all right, let me let me stop sharing for now that I can show everyone a magic trick. It's not that exciting. So I can say, okay, if, if the majority of the students want magic trick, I do this. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. So you kind of use the tool that we have because you could never do that in a classroom. Can you imagine in a lecture? <laughs> the students would just look at you like you're crazy. So I kind of took advantage of the camera to kind of interact with the students for a little bit. And if I if it's if they wanted a joke, then I already have my jokes ready, kind of um tucked away. So depending on the course, if it was for a pharmacy course, then I'll have a pharmacy joke ready if it was for medicine students i would kind of have more of a medical type joke so that that's the joke portion share exercise i would just you know kind of lead them through like okay let's swing your arms or or i know i do little silly things like that for a minute or two to kind of reset everyone's brains and then i go back into the content so that's kind of what i do that is excellent yeah. uh big fan uh Pam says that the music makes it, and I agree. Definitely got to have oh, the music yeah, with the magic trick. <laughs> okay, uh, we're just about at 1240. So it is my pleasure to introduce Janice Kung and her presentation, Effective Online Teaching Strategies During COVID-19. Uh, she's a public services librarian at the John W. Scott Health Sciences Library at the University of Alberta. Thank you so much. And great to see everyone here today. I respectfully acknowledge that I'm situated on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Due to the unprecedented impact of COVID-19 on the closure of all of our institutions, whether it's academic or hospital or special library, there was a sudden shift for librarians to teach online. And this resulted in a number of challenges, I'm sure, as we've all experienced, such as transitioning course content to a different mode of delivery, delivering content in a meaningful way, and integrating active learning strategies. I taught over 10 curriculum-based courses in the fall of 2020, and I'd like to present three case studies on how I transitioned them from in-person to remote classes. So let's start with the first case, flipped classroom. And I love how Claire kind of mentioned these things because I think we applied a lot of the same strategies. So it's kind of great that we're all in the, the same session together. So for each case, I'm going to provide a quick background for the course just to provide some context. So when I applied the flipped classroom to a medical laboratory science undergraduate course, and if this was mainly a research project course where they were required to complete a literature review and implement their research project. And so the objective of this session is to teach them how to conduct an effective literature search. And the length of the session was 90 minutes. Prior to COVID-19, it was an in-class session where I did a lot of demos. Uh, students had a lot of hands-on activities as well, and it was very interactive. And there was only one library needed, namely me. When we transitioned to the online environment, I was thinking really hard on how I can make the class more meaningful to the students rather than have them sit through an online lecture for 90 minutes, because I'm sure that would have bored them to tears. Even with my magic tricks, it wouldn't have helped. So I thought I'm going to flip it where I'm going to make them watch some videos in advance. And so I created three really short YouTube videos that kind of scaffolded off of one another to help them learn the skills for effective searching for literature. In the synchronous session, I met with all the students in one main Zoom room, and I, pro I provided a really quick quiz just to test their knowledge to see if they actually watched the videos. And then we broke them into three separate breakout rooms. And this is where I recruited my wonderful colleagues, so two librarians, to facilitate their own breakout room. And then the students had that time, dedicated time with the librarian to go over their searching for their topic. So there wasn't really a lot of teaching at that point because they would have watched the videos and would have known what to do. And they could have just um, kind of clarified some questions that they had or, or problems or challenges that they were still experiencing while searching online. So they it did require three librarians to do the online, but I think based on anecdotal evidence and feedback from the students, they thought it was a really effective strategy. So the tip 
for case one is don't forget to ask your colleagues for support. I'm learning that it helps to have a buddy, a backup person, someone who's monitoring chat, uh, monitoring the chat or um, answering any technical difficulties that they may be experiencing. So that helps a lot. Keep that in mind. You might want to, you know, tap into your colleagues for support. Case two, how to integrate active learning strategies for large classes. I'm going to talk about a pharmacy course that I uh, did a lot of active learning. Uh, well, I tried anyway, for a first year pharmacy course. There were about 130 students in this course. And the objective of the library seminar was to provide a quick library orientation on the services and resources, and primarily focusing on the library res um, pharmacy resources that they will be using throughout the program. For this seminar, it was 120 minutes, so two hours. Again, you can imagine how long that was in a Zoom environment. And so I did break it up with a lot of activities and ask them that, you know, do you want the exercise or the magic trick or, uh, or the joke? So I really uh, used those strategies for this class. Before COVID-19, again, really similar, provided demos, hands-on activities, very interactive. So you can see I kind of use the same formula for my in-class sessions. And I did require three librarians, so myself included and two colleagues, because that in-class session was in a massive computer lab. It, it, and I can't possibly walk through all the, the, the different rows and aisles. So, and I haven't learned to clone myself yet, so I needed the, the assistance of two colleagues to kind of um, walk around and monitor while they're working through activities if they had questions. So flip it to the online environment during COVID-19. I felt that I didn't need a librarian um, colleague, although I could have benefited from having someone monitor chat for me. But I did more frequent check-ins is what I did. And we're using the Zoom environment at our university, similar to this conference. And so what I did was I really investigated all of the features in Zoom to see how I can integrate those tools into the lesson. So what I did was I used the reactions that are available in Zoom. So initially they only had the clap, thumbs up, but I think now they've really expanded. So they have the, the confetti, the laugh cry emoji, and I can't remember what else. Oh, and then the shocked expression emoji. So I would get them to choose a reaction to see, just to check in. So for instance, if I got them to do a searching activity, I would say, give me confetti if you're done with that activity. And then I could quickly uh, glance through all the students to see um, how many are ready to move on. If not, then I'll give them another couple of minutes. So I would do those kind of check-ins or, you know, I explained a concept. Are there any questions or give me a thumbs up if you're good and then we can move on or clap your hands, give me some clapping hands if, if um, everything is making sense, that kind of thing. So those check-ins I thought was really helpful and it made them do an activity. So they're even, they're just clicking um, an icon, but still that kind of engages them somewhat. And really for this, I, it, I, it only needed one person, me, and I think it was fine, but I'm thinking in future, I could have really used another colleague to help me monitor chat for questions. So the tip for case two is to explore the tool that you're using and optimize it for the session. Because I know now, I mean, after the fact, that Zoom, they have a whiteboard feature where you can have learners draw and interact with whatever slide you have that, that you're sharing. So I thought that is amazing. I can get students to circle keywords or circle mesh terms if, I, um, if I'm getting them to search for, um, to do a, a searching kind of activity. So explore the tool because there are lots of neat things um, for different platforms and there might be some really neat things that you can integrate into your lessons. Case three, faculty collaboration. I think this is a no brainer that we want to collaborate with the faculty members, with the instructors. And it worked really well for an interactive EBM searching session that I did with this instructor. And this was for a second year pharmacy course. There, there were, again, a lot of students, around 130 to 140 students. 
the objective of this course was to kind of rem do a refresher on EBM or evidence-based medicine, and also to work across the hierarchy of evidence for finding the best evidence to answer a clinical question. This was another lengthy session that was two hours. And basically how I tried to integrate this into online was um, to work really closely with that faculty member. And before COVID, they were in, um, the students were in physical breakout rooms in groups working through a case. And then we brought them all back into a large lecture to debrief. So only one library needed me. For the online session, we used the Google Meet breakout rooms instead. So we had the Zoom as you know the, the major debrief and the introduction room where we kind of met all the students and welcomed them to the seminar. And then they would go into the breakout rooms for Google Meet links. And then the instructor and I would divide up all of the links, because you can imagine there were a lot of the links for 130 students. I think we had maybe 20 or 30 rooms. And then we would just pop in to each Google Meet link to check in and see how they're doing, if they have any questions, that kind of thing. And then at the end, we would bring them all back to the Zoom room to debrief again. And only one librarian was needed again because I work uh, closely with that faculty member. And I think that also worked really well. We did our best to transition um, that environment that we did for in-class to the online environment. And I think it worked really well. So I think the tip for this case is that you do want to work closely with the faculty member or the instructor to find new ways to engage students because there are ways to try to mimic or try as close as you can to provide the same learning environment for students in an online environment. So there are ways to kind of get around that. And now I'd like to provide some lessons that I learned from um, teaching all of these sessions online because there were a lot of mistakes that I learned along the way as well. And one of my colleagues, Megan Kennedy, shout out to Megan. Uh, she attended a symposium on e-learning in libraries. And she shared a lot of useful tips that she learned at that symposium. And it was really interesting because a lot of the best practices that they covered were some of the things that I learned as well. And some of the things that I incorporated into my uh, teaching. So I thought that it'd be really fun and interesting to kind of go over the best practices and the things that I learned. The first thing is that if you have an interactive component or an activity with the class, the fewer steps for the students to do something to participate, the better. So for instance, I know a number of you are familiar with online polling software, such as Mentimeter, Poll Everywhere. You want to reduce the steps that they need to do in order to participate. So for instance, you can copy paste the link into the chat. So the students just need, just need to click on that link and they can enter and then join in the poll or, or what have you. So try to put yourself in their shoes and minimize those steps that they need to do to participate. Second, online sessions do not have to be as long as in-person sessions. I'm sure that there's a lot of um, information out there that says um, when students are learning remotely or online, it's just, it's so exhausting, even for us, just staring at the screen all day. So if there are ways for you to flip the, the teaching where you get them to do certain things outside of the synchronous uh, portion, and then even reduce the synchronous time that you have with them, that would really help a great deal for the student just because all of their classes and, and teaching are all online. So any way that you can reduce um, the, the length of those sessions, I think is a good thing. And finally, give yourself a break. We are dealing with a new environment. So that means new rules are at play and online does not have to match in-person delivery by any means, and that's okay. And also embrace the silence. There are so many awkward silences when you ask a question and nobody responds. That's okay. So I, um, one of the faculty members taught me to do the 10 second count. You have to count to 10 seconds and eventually someone will respond. And 10 seconds feels like forever. Sometimes I don't make it, but I try. I try to count to 10 in my head. And if no one responds, then I will, you know, e either use the reactions on like, okay, well, what do you think about this? Do you agree with this? 
give me a thumbs up in the reaction because students are more prone to participate if it's low stakes kind of participation versus answering like a, a really in-depth or well-rounded type question. So you might have to change your question up a little bit to lower the stakes of how they participate. And that is everything that I wanted to share with you. And by no means am I an expert in online teaching. I'm a practitioner, so I am not an expert. So at this point, I welcome your feedback and your suggestions because I'm sure many of you do a lot of online teaching as well. And you might have some good tips and tricks for, for all of us today. So please let me know and I'm happy to learn from all of you as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. That was a great presentation. Um, there is one question in the chat already. And of course I encourage anyone else with questions to just pop them in there. Uh, it's from Sue and she's just wondering what software you use to create your case one YouTube videos and if you would use it again slash recommend it. Oh, yes. Great question. I use Zoom because we're, we use Zoom at our institution and there is a feature for you to record yourself when you're when you when you share screen and you're presenting, you can record yourself as right now we're recording this session, then you can download that file and then import into YouTube and then share the YouTube link. And why I love that is because YouTube has all of the, the neat accessibility that's already baked in to, the, to YouTube. So for instance, I don't have to worry about inserting subtitles. They will already do it for you. It's not perfect, but I would say it's about 80, 90% there. And then if you really wanted to, to perfect those subtitles, you can go in and then manually make those edits in YouTube. So I really like that feature of YouTube. I don't know if there are other recording programs that have that feature, but YouTube just does it. So yeah, good question. Very nice. Uh, so from Carrie Merkley, uh, she just said thank you. And she wants to add that if, any, if you need help monitoring chat during a session, uh, several instructors she knows uh, ask for a student in the class to volunteer to help and that apparently works pretty well. That is also a great suggestion. Thank you. Yes, get the students to work harder. Uh, Sandra Campbell says, great job, Janice. Uh, since you will be teaching the same courses next year, do you think that your revisions for next year in the online environment will take more, less, or the same time to complete with what you would have done for the in-class sessions? Ooh. I think now because I've already done it once, the online, it won't take as long to, to continue with the online uh, mode of delivery. But the first time when I did transition to online, it did take me some time because I was thinking of strategies on how to make it more engaging with the students. It's so hard with Zoom, right? And so I was trying to think of ways on like, hey, can I integrate more activity? Can I um, get them to do these kinds of things. But also remember, have to keep in, in mind that we don't want the session to be too long. They're not going to stay awake for two hours. So yeah, it's a it's fine balance. So I think the next time I do it, it won't take as long for sure. Yeah. Um, Jennifer is just wondering, was Google Meet a better option for your situation than Zoom breakout rooms? Yes, yes. So here, here's my rationale why. I know that there are breakout rooms in Zoom, but it's such a pain to figure out how you can um, how you can sort the students into certain breakout rooms if you already have set groups that you want them to be in. If you don't care, if it doesn't matter, it's a random assignment, then Zoom is perfect. However, if there is for some reason, some, maybe the instructor has already these um, groups that they've set up for the class you have to maintain the, the cohorts for each group. Then that's why we went into Google Meet because we had more control over just sharing that master document of all the Google Meet links. And then we say group one, this is your Google Meet link, group two, this one and so on and so forth. So it was just easier for the students to understand which links for them to use and for us to pop into the rooms as well. Yeah, great okay. question. Excellent. Um, I'm gonna read off a couple of comments while we uh, just have context for them. Morgan uh, Brandon says that they used uh, Teams and SharePoint for subtitles and trimming. Um, um, hey. And Christine Alfie, Alfie, sorry, uh, was just commenting on the um, asking for student volunteers. And she just said, if you're asking for student volunteers to consider the differential impact on if female or BIPOC students are feeling pressured to volunteer. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Um, 
last question. Tova Johnson was wondering uh, if you would repeat how you ensured that students actually watched the YouTube videos before the session because they just missed it the first time. Yes, no, no problem. So at the beginning of the synchronous session, when we all met in the Zoom, I had a quiz. I think I used Mentimeter, I can't remember, but I had five questions where they had to answer and it directly addressed whether or not they watch the videos on like, hey, what is the difference between and and or? What does the star, what does truncation mean? So I would ask those kinds of questions to test their knowledge and most of them, they, they did get them correct. So that was a good cue for me that yes, they watch the videos in advance, they're ready now to interact with the librarian to ask questions. Okay, excellent. Um, I think that we will shut it down here. Um, just to give folks a little time to transition to the next breakout room. Um, oh, we have one more question. We'll, we'll do that one. Um, Zara, I'm sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. It was just wondering, did you plan ahead in case they hadn't watched the videos? Ooh, good question. I think if I didn't plan ahead, but I, I tend to just think of what to do at the point in time. I think we all do. We kind of have to like just plan at the spur of the moment so no one had a no one i never had the student who didn't watch the videos but okay let's say if they didn't what i would do is i would have the other students go first with their questions and then have the student kind of pop in and say uh, and maybe ask how they would approach searching for their topic and then we could work together as a group so that would involve the students as well on how they could build their search so even though they didn't watch the videos, I think through those questions and discussions, they would have still captured the, the major components of those videos. Yeah, okay. great question. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Um, the next session is going to be starting in just a minute here, and it will be the table topics. Thank you so